Because of the coronavirus emergency, many people in Boston are faced with a crisis involving their health, their job, or their housing. The problems are bigger than what's usually taken care of by constituent services, so Boston City Councilors have responded by also spotlighting needs and advocating for help from other levels. To tell us about that is a councilor who represents East Boston, Charlestown, and the North End Waterfront. We'd like to welcome Lydia Edwards. Uh, thank you very much for taking time to be with us, Councilor. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Right. Councilor, I want to start with uh, the health needs, uh, especially mm -hmm. in East Boston. There's a higher than average incidence of the virus for the city. Uh, in the aggregate, people might say, well, at least it's not as bad as Chelsea, but closer up. What, what do you see? Well, you know, Chelsea, I would say, is our, our cousin, if not little brother, in terms of how, we're, how we look in demographics. So we should say ch Chelsea and, and, and understand what lessons we can learn so that we do not end up in the same situation. Uh, on the ground, what we're seeing is, you know, a lot of people who are frontline workers live in East Boston. They are the ones who are still grocery clerking. They're the ones who are cleaning up the hospitals. They're the ones who are cleaning up the airport. So a lot of folks, we have, I think, a very hard, large amount of people who are on the front lines who are exposed and are forced to choose between their lives and paying rent. And so they're going to go to work and they're going to work sometimes that second job, doing delivery, doing gig work in order to survive, in order to pay. Um, not just rent, but for food and other costs that they have. We have folks who have different immigration status. So they don't have an unemployment check. They don't have food stamps. They don't have other, any government relief coming to them. If they don't work, in many cases, they don't eat. So we're dealing with people who are going to expose themselves to the virus at a higher level, um, despite many great efforts to get more food to uh, folks in East Boston and throughout the city. You and uh, Councillor Ed Flynn uh, filed a resolution earlier this week about the concerns of immigrants. Uh, what were you thinking of, at least in East Boston? I was remind ourselves in this moment that a lot of the frontline workers, it's an invisible frontline of people who are uh, undocumented, but who have been working, who have ITIN numbers and been paying taxes into the billions of dollars. And to remind ourselves as a nation that a lot of what we rely on on a regular basis is because of the work of immigrant hands. And the backlash for our Chinese American or Asian American um, community, regardless of whether they're immigrants or not, is just abhorrent. But many of that is also directed at our Asian American immigrants. But also we're dealing with the fact that many people are, are blaming immigrants and often blame immigrants uh, when it comes down to lack of jobs. When, when there's a pan, an issue, a pandemic, an emergency, the first scapegoat is immigrants. So we wanted to stand up and say, as Americans, as patriots, as people who love our country, East Boston especially being second only to Ellis Island when it comes to making new Americans, that we're proud of who we are, where we come from, and we're a country of many countries. Just before the virus hit, there was a change in regulations for immigrants as far as access to government services, even for immigrants with legal status. Yes. Uh, how do you see that affecting people? Well, the, I think it was the um, the the change in the par not, not parole. Public charge. Uh, definitely. Public charge. Thank you. Um, and what that did is it, again, added to the stigma of people who are on, who need help, uh, that somehow they are less than deserving of citizenship or less than deserving of, of being here in this country. Uh, but and f further, it made it more, it made it something to hurt their chances of becoming a citizen um, and hurt their chances of becoming, I don't know, getting a green card. So they avoided it. They avoided applying for food stamps when they needed the food stamps. They avoided applying for Section 8 when they needed the Section 8. Again, they would have qualified, but if they're in the process of becoming a full-on citizen, they avoided, they avoided that very necessary aid, and that made them even more vulnerable in this time. Uh, this week, uh, President Trump said it's time to get people back to work, maybe on a phased-in basis but if you look at the community at least the, the district you represent what do you think people need so they feel assured they can go back safely i think it's time for the government to really work for the people before we put people out to work it's time for the government to acknowledge a twelve hundred dollars one-time stimulus check is not enough it's time for us to realize that too many people lost their health care because it's connected to their jobs it's time for government to respond in a big way to a huge pandemic that, I think, is the call to action, to tell people to go back to work, to tell people to open up their stores again, I think is irresponsible. We're not ready. 
we're, we are, I believe, in the middle of the surge. We're going to see, we haven't even got to the apex here in Massachusetts. So we're not ready to open up. Absolutely should be planning for the best case scenario and the worst case scenario in terms of how we're going to move on from this. We should be in that planning phase. But to think we're ready to do it, I think is irresponsible. Well, another way to put this is, what does it take to make people feel they can safely ride the green, uh, excuse me, the blue line uh, at peak hours? I think what it's gonna take is mass testing. So everyone can get a test to see if they have it or not, or have the antibodies and been exposed. I think it's gonna take systems that allow for people to take time off um, and have the sick leave that they need, regardless of their immigration status. It's gonna need, I think we're gonna need an infrastructure that supports people being able to go back to work part-time, uh, on a, uh, you know, see and go, touch and go basis. I think we're going to need a more supportive government. And what instead people are feeling is they're forced to walk the plank, walk the plank and see if it works out. And I think that that's just, no one's going to feel comfortable until they feel it there. They have the PPE that they need, that they have the supportive resources that they need, and that they can slowly go back to work that way. I want to ask you about the, the rent crisis for people. Uh, mm -hmm. You are the other counselors were working on that early on. Uh, there was mm -hmm. something I think that got passed in the uh, state legislature this week, yeah. but uh, what about the importance of the council's role in leading to that? So there's two different conversations, right? Um, we uh, in Boston, right away, we had uh, BHA, the Boston Housing Authority, uh, cancel evictions. We had looked at the BMC and other courts. They closed outright. Uh, they just closed, but there was the issue of people not being able to pay rent, which is still an issue that we're dealing with with one program. And then there's the eviction, which is what the state house is dealing with. Uh, we called, I think Council Arroyo actually called for a moratorium on mortgages and rent, um, excuse me, yes, mortgages and, uh, and, and, and evictions, but also looking at uh, mortgage uh, canceling uh, to a certain extent uh, requirement to have to pay rent in this time. Uh, we all signed on to that resolution saying we need to do more uh, we need to stand up as a state to say that this this should not be a choice someone has to deal with, whether I die and go to work or whether I pay my mortgage or pay my rent. Um, and at this point, you know, we're, I'm 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 beyond excited about what the state house is about to do in terms of the protections that they will provide people in evictions and and in foreclosure. Uh, but right now, for those who don't who fall for those who don't qualify and may not get that relief, we still have people falling through the cracks. And that's why we're really pushing for rent relief direct payments to landlords in Boston. And of course, the mayor helped out as well, too. He reached of course. the course. Yeah, yeah, no, he was great. I want to ask you about the future because, you know, right now, uh, things have been so rattled, whether it comes to the housing market, the job market. Uh, and uh, is this a time to start planning for the future? What do you think? Um, you never stop planning, period, um, the, but we need to, and the future's changed. We are not going to go back to normal. Normal demonstrated that we had too many in inequalities, we had too many issues, and we were too fragile. So yes, we need to be planning and we need to be thinking about the lessons we're learning from this moment and how to go forward. Now, of course, that also means decisions about development projects. Uh, yeah. You know, you had a huge project that was planned at Suffolk Downs, and, and a lot of people might want to- plan. What happens? Well, what happens is you, when you are dealing with this moment, our recovery and that plan, for example, at Suffolk Downs are deeply intertwined. And so the same conversations we had right before this, um, this crisis we're having in the middle of this crisis, and that is how does planning work or doesn't work? We, I have proposed an amendment that required the BPDA to plan with equity, to look at civil rights, to look at the impact on different populations, as a result of the plans and decisions that they make, especially at Suffolk Downs. That working session we're gonna have on April 22nd, we're continuing that because I believe that there needs to be a commitment by the city of Boston to an equity analysis because our recovery needs it. And the best way to do that is in our zoning and how we're gonna plan for the future. And so we are continuing those vital conversations. We want the city of Boston to commit in writing to a zoning amendment that requires equity analysis um, and requires fair housing uh, analysis when it's planning. And I think that's vital to our recovery. You also, I think, have a housing uh, event. Is it coming up tomorrow? Yes, actually we do. We have a housing, I guess, Know Your Rights and Know Your Resources, a talk that we're having on uh, Facebook Live slash on Zoom, and we've posted it up. Uh, we want people to basically come in, and we're going to go through a lot of what 
we'll talk about the actual rights that people have and talk about the new law that we hope gets signed today. And if not, when it gets signed, what rights they'll have. We also want to talk about many, many resources. And, you know, there's this, this almost an in, information flood and it's overwhelming if you're already stressed out. So we want to break down what you have at the federal level, what you have at the state level, what you have at the city level for those in Boston. And we want people to also demonstrate and speak their stories and speak their truth so that if we're not meeting them where they need us to meet them as elected officials, that they tell us what they need directly. I think it's going to be a great conversation. Another thing that uh, people uh, throughout the city are struggling with right now is educating their children when they're not mm -hmm. able to go to school. Uh, what, what are you hearing in the district? Uh, in the district, I've heard a couple things. I mean, there's been the number one priority initially was food. Let's be very frank. It was how people are going to get that school lunch or school food to their kids. Um, then came the, the Chromebooks. And in many cases, people are getting the Chromebooks. And we still have some gaps. A lot of, um, there was just, a, it demonstrated a tech divide. You know, you get a Chromebook and if you don't have a computer otherwise in your life and you may not speak English as a first language, how am I supposed to use this, this to help my, my child who may not be a teenager yet who's that much into technology? How, how am I supposed to help with the eight-year-old, with the nine-year-old, the 10-year-old. So those were some, some gaps that also were exposed in this process. I think I'm, I just wanna thank a lot of the BPS teachers, the paras, the people who are out there who are either delivering meals, who are talking to their kids, who are calling up the families. It just demonstrated how much of a family and how connected we really are in our educational institutions. And I just am so very proud of them and the leadership uh, from the superintendent. But it did expose that in many cases, we still are looking for, not all kids have logged in, for example. We need to find out where they are. Just before the virus uh, struck Boston and the decision was made to close schools, uh, we got word of the uh, memorandum of agreement uh, between the city mm -hmm. and the state to do a widespread turnaround effort in Boston. A lot of schools with, with serious problems, uh, but you have some reservations about this. I have reservations about doing a turnaround uh, based off of data that I think will be completely irrelevant um, as we have no idea what the learning gap will be. So you want to turn around based off tests that were before the pandemic, where I think is irrelevant. I think we should wait. We should retest and see where we are. I don't believe we're going to have school this year. I think we're going to be testing and trying to figure out where kids are and where they're going to go in terms of grades and, and how they're going to deal with whatever PTSD they've had. Uh, from this moment, we know that everybody has a safe home to go home to. Um, so all of these things, we will need to reassess and dedicate, I think, all of our efforts to checking in on ourselves before we're trying to meet a new standard, a new goal, which I think, again, will be irrelevant. On top of that, um, all of my schools in my district are now part of the new Kaleidoscope program. And I think a lot of us are still wondering what that means. I, we hope it's beneficial. We hope that also it comes with additional money. Uh, what concerns are that it's just a Trojan horse and it allows for the state to just further invert itself and the decision making of the everyday teacher um, uh, in, in BPS. So we're cautiously optimistic about the Kaleidoscope program. I just firmly believe that I think there's a 60 day delay for the DESI, uh, the MOU, excuse me. And I think it should be it should be completely off the table until we figure out where we are and what we look like as BPS. Well, when the memorandum of understanding was, was, was put together, I think a lot of us were, were assuming there would be a lot more money for schools. Uh, yeah. And and the budget looks pretty uh, dismal. Well, yeah, that's the other thing, too. A lot of it is dependent on the Student Opportunity Act that passed, and now we're hearing that that's being gutted. The, so there's, there's funds that would help meet these standards, again, that I find are still off. But... That funding could be dwindling. Uh, we now are meeting new standards and inviting the state to be part of conversations. And if they come in with no resources, then I think that that's just a setup for failure. 